This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Fern Neiman. Welcome back, MHP Nation. Here we are again today, working to help you save money and make money. Today's topic is one of the most important pieces of MHP law. I don't say that about everything. It's This is one of the things that makes mobile home parks a little more distinct than other real estate classes. What I'm talking about today is zoning and getting your zoning right can make or break your deal a financial mistake here will be fatal if you have improper zoning so talking about zoning there's really three types of zoning for your mobile home park there's legal meaning it's allowed it's legal it's and it's in compliance with the current zoning code then there's illegal meaning it is not currently in compliance with the zoning code and it was never really legally approved anyway believe it or not there are some mobile home parks that were just built without the law. Uh, they just sometimes, you know, Farmer John said, I want to build a mobile home park, and the city said no. And he said, I'm doing it anyway. And he was connected with the city, or the city just didn't have the money or the stones to call him out on it, and he just kind of kept on going all this time. And decades later, there's an illegal park there. You can't buy that park because you're not from that town. You're not one of the good old boys. They may say, welcome neighbor, and by that I mean, welcome neighbor, get rid of your mobile home park. As we all know, there's a not a lot of love for municipal government for mobile home parks, so it's not very far-fetched to think that as soon as you buy that park, they're going to try to get rid of you. So you definitely can never buy an illegal mobile home park. As far as legal, the first item there, I mean, it's pretty rare to find a legal conforming mobile home park. Uh, if you did new development, which is pretty rare, then maybe it would, would. But most all mobile home parks, they fall into this third you know, mystical category called legal non-conforming, or is it better known as grandfathering. I'm sure you've all heard that term, grandfathering. What is grandfathering? Well, grandfathering, its, its roots are interesting. Historically, grandfathering was used in voting laws, and it's obviously uh, today not as popular, and it's uh, kind of socially taboo. Um, some, some cities and states are even trying to get rid of the term grandfathering because originally it was used to suppress the voting rights of, of poor, illiterate blacks, uh, mostly in the South, around the time of the Civil War. And the term grandfathering came, came around because these southern states were passing these laws saying you have to, you know, some things they did were pass laws like pay a poll tax, which obviously had a money contribution to it. But otherwise, there was, there was like a litmus test, you know, like, hey, you have to be able to read. Hey, you have to have some of these other criteria, so, you know, maybe even own land, some of these things that typically did not happen for poor folks. Well, obviously, there are poor white folks, brown folks, yellow folks, purple folks, black folks, all of the above. So, hmm, that didn't really accomplish the race of, racist objective. So how did they get around it? They made a rule. Well, if your grandfather could vote, let's say before mm, 1876, well, then you're grandfathered in and you too get to vote. So essentially what they did was if your white grandpa could vote, you get to vote too, even if you're a poor, illiterate white person. So that's the history of grandfathering, Okay. In today's world, how is grandfathering impacting us? Well, it's typically with zoning. And by that, I talk about non-conforming uses. And de- the definition of a non-conforming use is, you know, it's generally defined as a land use or a structure that was legal when it was established, but is not currently conform to the current zoning ordinance. So it's legal, but it's not really conforming. And these pre-existing land uses, these are not really favored by local governments. So they sometimes put restrictions on them to try to get you to, you know, revise your plan or revise your building. So, for example, if, I, if I'm if i running, you know, Ferd's Tire Shop in a residential neighborhood, and at the time I started the business, that retail tire shop or service center was allowed, then if the law says, oh, wait, now you can't do that in this, zone, in this zoning district because it's now residential, well, I get some time to change. And essentially, I'm grandfathered in. As long as I keep operating as a tire shop, as a retail retail facility, then I get to do so. But if I ever stop and I abandon my use or I change my use and say, you know, I'm no longer tires. I'm going to become a, a bed and breakfast or I'm going to become, 
an office building. Well, that's not going to work because now the current zoning says it's residential. So there's there can be some legitimate and valid restrictions on your grandfathering, but you re- generally you get to continue to use, use the current use. So for mobile home parks, what's really important is what is our use? Well, our use at the time when the park was established is often a parking lot. Because let's be honest, most of these parks were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s when people actually would pull up to the trailer court, plug in their RV slash trailer, and spend the night, spend a week. And back then, you know, mobile home parks and trailers were more affluent. The people that used them were more affluent. So the cities weren't that hostile to them. And you'd come to town, spend your money, go to, out to eat in restaurants and go to a show. And they kind of liked you. Well, obviously, in the last 50 years, the stigma has changed in the... And the income strata, uh, if not stereotypically the class of the clientele, has changed and has really made mobile home parks undesirable. So it's key that to you, if you're going to try to maintain your zoning, is that you always operate as a mobile home park. You always have at least a for rent sign or at least one mobile home, one mobile home on your lot. And then you can help preserve your zoning and your grandfather status. So ultimately, you need, a, you need to read the code. This is really important when you're under contract and due diligence to buy a mobile home park. You need to understand the code. And this would be a good time to hire a zoning attorney. I know a lot of people like to play an attorney on TV, but this is probably not one of those times. And trust me, I spent uh, about three years after law school just focusing on zoning and you know, municipal law at a Kansas City law firm. And my, my mentor, Mike White, literally wrote the book, Missouri Land Use Law and Missouri Economic Development Law. That's about 2,500 pages, and I served as his co-editor with him on that publication. It's a treatise, which is, you know, the foremost authority on the topic. So I got up to my eyeballs and zoning variance, special use permits, a number of other things related to municipal law. So I can tell you, they don't teach you all of it in law school. you got to get experience after law school, so they definitely don't want you to do it if you don't have that experience, if you don't have a law background. So this is not a time to be chintzy. This is super important. You have to... Get your zoning right. I'm going to go over 10 key provisions now that you have to have in your zoning letter or your certificate of zoning. Basically, this is a, the certificate of zoning or the zoning letter is a letter on the city's letterhead that you can rely upon. And you want it to be that, you know, this is for Deerford and company and lenders, investors, successors, partners, assigns. Basically, when I sell the park, I can say, look, this is golden. And it's kind of like your insurance policy. So you want to make sure this is written by the right person. So when I draft a zoning letter, I will typically contact the planning director. If you can go straight to the planning or zoning director, it's generally easier. They start going up the food chain to the city manager or the mayor sometimes gets involved, or they bring in the city attorney, then it becomes more difficult and you have more negotiation. But I've had many times where I draft a very detailed, very favorable zoning letter, and I convince the city planning director or zoning director that, hey, this is this is all the gospel and you ought to just believe it. And, and it's, typically it's right and true, but some cities don't agree. Sometimes I'll get guys that just say, okay, cool, where do I sign? And they will sign it and send it right back. And it's a really easy to get valuable piece of paper. Other times you have to fight. And we'll get into that here in a little bit, but I'm going to go over 10 key things that got to be, no matter what, in your zoning letter, at least on your first try. Sometimes you got to negotiate down and sometimes you, some of these you just can't negotiate down. But here's what I like to have in there. Number one, a reference that there are currently no outstanding code violations for this property. If there are, then let me know. And you can maybe they're a big deal. Maybe you can use them for renegotiation with the seller. Uh, but if they're a big deal, you want to know about them. I bought a park once, and the, the prior park owner did not do this. And literally, like the first week they operated it, they had to get a business license. It was like a $100 business license. Normally it's a rubber stamp, but that caused a review of the entire park, and there were like 26 zoning and code violations present on the property on day one. They then bought like 10 used used and new homes to bring into the park, and the city would not permit them. They said, we're not going to permit the homes until you fix the prior code violations. They made them, the people set the homes on site, They were then required to take them off-site and then go rent a parking lot, park them off-site where they were all vandalized. They then had to bring them back on-site after fixing all the code violations, get their permits, renovate new homes while on-site. I mean, this was a a school of hard knocks to the tune of thousands of dollars of tuition, something you don't want to pay. Okay, the second item that your zoning letter should cover is what's the current zoning? I mean, you should say, this is currently zoned R4. 
general multifamily residential district, whatever it is, and then have them identify and set forth which of the three categories it is. It's legal, illegal, or the typical legal nonconforming. The third item you need in your zoning letter is really just a reference that it's not subject to the redevelopment or expansion provisions of the code, meaning, you know, and I say this, and as a follow-up to our discussion, routine repair, maintenance, and operation of the park, open parent, including bringing in additional mobile homes, closed parent, does not trigger the redevelopment or expansion provisions of the code. So one of the key tenets of grandfathering is you cannot expand or exacerbate the use. So if I currently have you know, Ferge Retail Building in a, in a residential neighborhood, and my building's 4,000 square feet, I cannot increase it to 5,000 or 6,000 or 10,000. That's a problem. Some cities will give you some leeway where if, you know, if my building's knocked down, I can rebuild it the same size. Or if my building's knocked down less than 50%, I can repair it. That's, and I can always do routine maintenance. I can you know, fix the roof of my building. So for a mobile home park, what you don't want is to fall into the new development or redevelopment provisions of that code. Because basically a lot of cities, since they don't like mobile home parks, they'll, they can't straight up block them from being in a community because there's there's some constitutional challenges like that with just like you'll see a lot of times in towns like an asphalt plant or a dirty bookstore or something on the outskirts of town or outskirts of the county it's because they're required to give it some place to be so they don't put it on main street they stick it out in the back so mobile home parks they're kind of required to allow them but they the way they get around it is they just put these really onerous you know safety and moral welfare provisions like you must have 30 foot roads you must have four foot sidewalks you must have curbs and gutters and stormwater detention and uh, BMPs and uh, underwater storm shelter and underground storm shelter and all these sort of things that just add the cost to basically make new development financially infeasible. So you don't want to, you know, just repave your asphalt and knock down two houses and get dinged as like, oh, this is a new development, a redevelopment. No, 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 no. You want to just say, hey, it's not subject to these codes unless I do A, B, and C. And sometimes I will specifically reference the code provisions for each of these different criteria. Okay, number four. You want your zoning letter to say a mobile home can be placed on all of the existing vacant lots or pads. And I also like to say, and it has setbacks in accordance with, you know, section R4 or M1 or whatever the zoning districts are. You want to be able to tell you what your setback requirements are. Number five, a mobile home can be placed on all the existing occupied mobile home park lots. So you had number four was vacant lots. Number five is occupied, because you may want to tear down a house. The house may move out. You don't want to lose that lot forever. So it's important to bifurcate the two and reference both of them in your zoning letter. And then also reference the setbacks. And setbacks is something that I really like to try to get the city to basically waive or exempt. The only setback they never waive is fire code. And fire code trumps your constitutional rights of grandfathering because it's for the public health and safety. You can't put a mobile home two feet from another mobile home. Okay, even if even at the at the time the park was built, there was no setback requirements. That is that is something allowed to trump. It's generally ten or fifteen feet between homes, but this uh, that setback is harder to get rid of. The setback that you can get rid of, if you're good at this, and if this you can persuade the city that you're just a parking lot and you predate the code, you can get rid of the exterior perimeter setbacks. So I've got a park um, here in Missouri. I had about thirty vacant lots that from the internal street to the exterior property line, the lot was like 76 feet one inch. Well, a very common size mobile home is a 1680, which is a 16 by 76. You take four feet off for the, the hitch or the tongue. And I could fit that in there physically with an inch to spare. A couple times, I think I touched the neighbor's fence, right? Don't tell. Okay, that 76 foot home, that's a nice three bedroom home. I can sell that home in my sleep. As opposed to a 66 foot home, eh, it's a little tougher. Well, the setbacks exterior in the zoning code said 15 or 20 feet, depending on front, rear, and side setbacks. Well, that's going to really neuter the size of those lots. I'm going to be bringing in a 48-foot home, 54-foot home. I mean, that may be a double wide. Or maybe I can't afford double wides, or my market can't support them. Or maybe that's the houses are going to be too close together from side to side, and it costs me lots. So it's a big problem. So I fought the city on this, and I convinced the planning director that my, my park predated the code, and therefore no perimeter setbacks applied to me. And he eventually agreed. And you know what? I've, in the last two years, I think I've got three left. I think I've brought in and moved and sold or rented 27 perimeter lots with 76-foot homes. 
In the meantime, a national operator, a top five mobile home park owner, bought a park literally a thousand feet down the street from me. And those guys, they must not have hired a zoning lawyer because they're clearly big, bigger, better operation, right? Well, maybe not uh, in this little niche because you know what they did? They got setbacks that they're, that, that they're adhering to and they have a 60-foot home in there, in a couple of cases, a 66-foot home. These guys demoed 60 bad homes in their park, brought in 15 homes spec the first day. We literally bought these parks about the same time as one another, so I'm going head-to-head with these guys. A year later, I think they sold two or three. They still have the original 60-foot homes there because nobody's going to buy a three-bedroom, 60-foot cracker box or tuna can when I got a 76-footer right down the street. And... They got it great. They got an extra 15 feet of backyard. Nobody cares. People care about side yards where you build a deck, and they care about the interior size of their home. So getting the setbacks right, I mean, the, those lots in that, in that municipality, they're worth about 40000 an occupied lot. So I'm literally talking this one point on one park, make it or break, me a million dollars. And I got a national operator down the street getting their butt kicked with 60-foot homes. And I, I, I pity that manager. I tell my manager all the time, like, aren't you lucky you're not selling these? And they're like... I drive in there about once every two weeks, really just to kind of make my day that we are winning because of that zoning letter. Can't emphasize enough how important this stuff is. Okay, next, number six. You want your zoning letter to reference the location of the homes within the park and the internal setback or spacing requirements. Because as I mentioned, the fire code can trump you, but sometimes the cities will have internal spacing requirements like 40 feet. That's crazy. I want to get them to exempt that. I've even gotten exempted on paper, even though I know... The fire marshal can come in. So I don't I don't put homes closer than 10 feet. Some places 15. And typically the concrete guy or the install guy will, will be attuned to that too. And they're like, hey, man, I'm not putting this home. I've had to get through the tape measure, and it was like 10 feet 1 inch, and there was an eave, like an awning on the home, and I got the planning director to come specifically. This was the codes inspector, actually. I got the codes inspector specifically put in writing that he's counting the body of the home to the body of the home and not the awning. So I, I was really like 8.5 feet apart. Um, so anyway... It's important to get this stuff in writing. Another quick story. Um, one time I didn't get it in writing because of the timeline to close and because of the, the difficulty of the seller, so we, I couldn't make it work to go to the go to the uh, plan commission. Well, this was going to require a variance, actually, which we'll get into in another episode, but a variance is basically an exception from the zoning code, generally due to an undue hardship that you didn't cause. And I was looking to bring in a couple homes it's like an 18 space park. I was gonna bring in three homes, and there was and the alley was and the setbacks in the alley was not gonna allow me to bring in the three unless I got a variance. Talked to the planning administrator, city administrator, and the mayor, and they all said, "Great, you know, out of state guy, gonna bring in some new money, fill this park up, clean this park up. Sounds great." Well, while we were under due diligence, and after our earnest money went firm, the mobile home park that was literally adjacent to ours and was really beat up and rough. One of the homes caught on fire. I think it was like a meth deal. And somebody burned alive. And they died in this fire. And luckily, the rest of the homes didn't catch on fire. But that's the, that's the nightmare scenario. Like, you know, Nero or Chicago's fire or something. That, yeah, one starts the next and the next the next. So everybody was just gun shy. And they said, we're not going to let you cram in a home closer than the current law. You know, even if you're going to pour a new investment in here. So that happened to me. And I had just closed the park. Or I was in the process of closing the parks. We ended up buying it. They they said they'd still give us the variance. We went to the city council and the planning commission. They said no. They said no again. So uh, we sold that park. We immediately put it for sale. Said, you, you don't deserve our investment. Canton, Missouri, that's where it was. So we were really pissed um, because they told us they'd give us a deal, and then they didn't. But that was the only time I, I trusted the government. You know, Ronald Reagan is famous for saying, trust but verify. It's in reference to the Soviet Union. I've become more cynical. Maybe that's the lawyer in me, but I uh, don't trust and I verify. So that Canton, Missouri story is part of the reason there. Next up, number seven in your zoning letter, that there are no restrictions on the size of the homes or the age of the homes. Now, there are some federal law guidelines that any homes pre HUD, pre 1976, cannot be relocated into the home, or really can't, into the park, but really can't be transported. But that doesn't happen very often anyway. So I'll sometimes I'll throw the city that bone and say, nothing before 1976. I'm not going to do that anyway. I'm going to bring in newer homes, 90s, 2000s, fix them up, you know. Maybe brand new homes even, depending on the market. But some cities will try to put this in there. Um, 
it's it's generally not enforceable, but it happens a lot. I get a lot of calls from people saying, hey, the city says I need to bring in homes five years or newer. Okay, is that five years from today, or is that a rolling five years? Do I have, like, a five-year shot clock? You know, like I'm buying a 92 Taurus or something, and, I, and it's only a matter of time until it's going to implode? That's not a very good thing to agree to, so I would fight that like crazy. Uh, number eight. The, they make sure this, the zoning letter says the code does not impose any requirements or restrictions as it per, pertains to the concrete pillars or pads under the homes. Okay, typically the cities don't regulate the mobile home install. They may have a certificate of occupancy or some sort of permit, but they don't typically get too into the weeds on the, in, on the infrastructure underneath the concrete. The state does. The state really carries out the HUD rules. HUD rules, depending on your, your location and what the frost line is, like in a lot of my places, it's anywhere from 36 to 42 inches of concrete depth. That's really expensive. I and mean, you're talking about $3,500 to $4,000 on a single wide, you know, almost double that on a double wide. If you've got a used home, typically you're immune from HUD code, or at least the state's not inspecting it, so you can do six inches of concrete or plastic pier pads, and you're talking a couple hundred bucks. Um, or maybe a thousand bucks, so much cheaper. So that's a lot. That's one reason why people like the the used homes, which we will talk about more in a different episode. But I like to get the city to say they're not going to mess with me on that. They usually say we don't care. Uh, so I at least try to throw that in there. Okay, number nine. Uh, I mentioned earlier about not being subject to the development code based on expansion. Another thing you want to make sure is that you're not subject to development code or any new infrastructure requirements or impact fees or development fees based on the transfer of the park from you. Some some cities will say, oh, now it's a transfer. You need to pay this new fee. I bought a park, and I asked them spe- specifically, are there any transfer fees, impact fees, development fees? They said no, and bought it in the beginning of the year. I bought it December 21st, and they said, you got to pay us to the city permit. Okay, um, it's not due till April 30th, but they don't know. With the transfer, you got to do it again. I was like, okay, what is it, 50 bucks? No, this was a, in a different code provision. I didn't catch it. It was 25 or $50 per lot. It was $1,350 or something. I then had to 10 days later turn around and do it again because I, because the last guy's license wasn't good. And like that was a that was a pain, you know, paying the same fee twice in the first two weeks. Not fun. So really, you want to get them to sign off. There's not any of that stuff. And tried, and I've learned to expand my verbiage on that that provision. Number ten. This is kind of my catch-all. Uh, the mobile home park predates the code of 1975 uh, and the code of 19, of 2017. Whatever it is, the the city often will not know how old the park is. So I'll throw something in, something in there. Of note, the city makes no representation as to the exact age of the park, other than it existed as a mobile home park prior to the code that was adopted in 1975. Of note, the current owner of the property indicates the park was constructed prior to 1975. And that gives us some cover. Well, here's the deal. That's, I don't want to say that's kind of the weasel clause, but generally one through nine, the city zoning guy is like nodding his head like, yeah, yeah, that's right. That is this current zoning. That is the current setback. Okay. But then like this number 10, I mean, if you really want to fight, you could say, wait a second, you just said I predate the code. And if I predate the code, then you've admitted the code does not apply to me. And I'm grandfathered. And every once in a while you get a city that has outside counsel. A lot of these smaller towns, they don't have, they have like a, you know, one size fits all attorney that makes like 62000 a year. And they do, you know, lawsuits, they do HR, they do contracts, they do public works, legislative assembly, all that stuff. And they're kind of jack of many trades, you know, jack of all trades, but really an expert not in zoning. So they don't catch that. But some cities, they don't have a regular attorney at all, so they have to hire outside counsel from two counties over and then that guy charges $400 an hour and he's like throwing that provision out. So I throw it in there, but it's also like the first one that gets lopped off all the time. So those 10 things are my kind of dream zoning letter. Uh, if the city objects, then what do you do? I mean, I first you get to decide if it's worth it. I mean, I had a client that the city objected and the guy was just obstinate, you know, crotch old man. This is my zoning code. You know, I said, you know, you're wrong and we can sue you. He goes, bring it on. So I told the client like, if we sue, it's going to cost probably twenty five grand. They're going to appeal. It's going to cost another twenty five grand. Then you're going to win. Great. What do you get? Well, you get to use the three lots that might have homes that are a little too big now or a little too close to the property line now, and those homes are still functional. You know, do you want to mess with that? He's like, No, I don't. So we lost. You know, we just caved because it was more of a. It was not a legal decision. It was a business decision. Okay, and, and that's something I try to bring to all my situations, all my clients, and all my own projects is, look, 
I'm going to put on my businessman cap for a second, take off the lawyer cap. The lawyer cap's going to, you know, bang his head, his fist on the table and say, we're going to win and I'm going to sue and here's your, here's my bill. Hey, okay? I'm all about client advocacy, but sometimes you have some common sense to say, the juice ain't worth the squeeze, okay? So you have to decide that first. And you decide that really throughout the process. It's, that's kind of the decision point. There's numerous decision points throughout your due diligence. And then at some point you may say, you know what, City of Jackson, I read the code and I hired a zoning lawyer and we're going to sue. And really it's a threat to sue and demand letter. And that works a ton of the time. And here's why. Cities, a lot of small towns especially, they can't afford to go to litigation and they certainly can't afford to lose. And here's the smoking gun. This is probably the most important thing in zoning law. I learned this from Mike White. Because zoning is in your grandfather's rights is a constitutional right, if they give you an unreasonable right, to, if they are unreasonable at using your property, or they have an unreasonable right to rezone, or they essentially damage your value against your constitutional rights, they have taken something from you. It's a taking. I think it's under uh, the Eighth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution. But the key with it, when they violate your constitutional rights is. Under the Civil Rights Act of 1976, Title 42 Civil Rights Act, you can, which is obviously had nothing to do with mobile home parks, and it really I don't think anything to do with zoning, but under Title 42 of the Civil Rights Act, if you win, you can pursue legal fees. Normally in America, they call it the American rule, is if I sue you and you sue me and vice versa, whether, whether I win or you lose, both parties pay their own lawyers. And that really you know, deters a lot of litigation because these lawyers aren't convinced people, I'll win and then I'm free. And they do that on, you can do that on plaintiff's contingent fee stuff. Like, you only pay me if we win. But in most litigation, each party pays their own legal fees. There is an exception under the Civil Rights Act. So you can go to the city and, and you can, when you file a lawsuit, you can also file a claim for attorney's fees under the Civil Rights Act. And my old law firm, it was White Gas in Kansas City, Missouri, they did this several times. I was not the litigator on the team but the people down the hall, they did this several times, and they won. And, man, that was painful. And you got a whole, you know, top law firm billing this thing. The city doesn't want to get hit with a $100,000, $200,000 bill. So it really acts as a bluff. Now, you can't bluff every time. It's like playing poker, right? So the firm won some of these, and that reputation got around. So bringing that up or finding your local law firm, not necessarily local, but somebody in your state or somebody that's knowledgeable in this that can bring that hammer, man, that's huge. And that really can get them to cave fast. So, but if you do sue and you win, you got to prepare for an appeal because cities hate to lose. And, and there's a small city outside of Kansas City, I think it's called Village of Oaks. They've been sued like five times in their zoning code and they've won several of them. They've lost, I think, one or two and then they appeal and it just becomes a big quagmire that nobody wants to be in a lawsuit you know except for maybe the attorneys but even then i don't even know why an attorney want to be in a lawsuit i think they're miserable but anyway uh hopefully i've convinced you not that you need convincing this is pretty obvious that getting your zoning letter or your certificate of zoning is crucial to your deal so never buy an illegal park feel free to buy a legal park and be cautious and be prudent when buying a legal non-conforming i.e grandfathered park so there you have today you learned a little bit about history uh, learn a little bit about zoning until the next time invest well save money make money and before i forget for no money you can go to my website mobilehomelawyer.com and you can get a list of these 10 things that you've got to include in your zoning letter you've been listening to the mobile home park lawyer podcast with ferd neiman ready to learn more Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.